We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These words from the Declaration of Independence are familiar to many of us, and yet it took 143 years for women to get the right to vote, and 189 years for black people to get the right to vote. And still today, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are still only words for many people. Here in Boston, Life expectancy varies by 30 years, depending on where you live. In Roxbury, with many poor and black people, life expectancy is 59 years. In the Back Bay, wealthy and mostly white, life expectancy is 91 years. It's tough to have liberty when you are in prison. The United States incarcerates 716 people for every 100,000 people. Our rate of incarceration is more than five times higher than most countries in the world. Millions of people in our country don't have health care, a decent job, good education, a home they can afford, and that makes it pretty hard to pursue happiness. So on this show, you are going to meet people who are making it possible to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. People today who are making the words of the Declaration of Independence come true. Welcome, my name is Michael Jacoby Brown and I'm your host for We Hold These Truths. Today, we're very lucky to have Peter Gilman Shapiro, author of a terrific book, The Good Landlord. Uh, Peter. Uh, is himself a, a small landlord. And uh, Peter, can you tell us a little bit uh, about your background and how you became uh, a s relatively small landlord? Well, thanks. Thanks for inviting me in. Michael. Sure. It's great. Great yeah. to have you. Yeah. I, I um, was among many uh, small landlords who didn't think they were going to become small landlords. And I <laughs> did my traditional work uh, for a year, schooling and work. And um, when my dad offered a little bit of money to me in the late 80s, I um, ended up buying a three family. I, did, I could have bought a one family. I wasn't really thinking about rental housing. Um, it was here in Boston, right? In Jamaica Plains, Jamaica a Plain. section right. of Boston, sure. uh, where I've been living for some years. And uh, uh, my dad got interested. He said, hey, why don't we try investing? It wasn't a thought in my mind. Uh, right. And then I ended up buying uh, three triple deckers. I bought an old lodging house. Um, and I had the uh, benefit of a, a, a great broker and uh, mm. really made it happen over a number of years. And that's how I, you know, unexpectedly became yeah, a small uh, landlord. Many people, actually, including myself, I'm a very small landlord, a teeny tiny landlord. I have <laughs> one building, uh, one apartment where I used to live. But many people end up becoming small landlords, find it kind of challenging to manage their buildings. Stuff goes wrong. They don't know who to call. Uh, can you explain, uh, you know, what it's like in more detail? Right. It's a funny thing uh, because we're talking about small landlords and later on we'll distinguish what I call small landlords from larger owners. But mm -hmm. for many small landlords, uh, the term people often use is accidental. They mm. backed into the business. Um, might yeah. have been because you, uh, some guy or woman is good at plumbing or electrical and a building that needed a whole lot of work, the owner said, here it is, a tender loving care special, TLC special. The person bought it because they knew how to fix. Or mm -hmm. your family sold a building, uh, I mean, uh, owned a building that you inherited, a number of you as family members, and one of you ends up taking responsibility for it. So for so many owners, um, it became something they never expected to do and never sort of prepared themselves to do, which yeah. we'll discuss, you know, yeah. about what are the challenges of being a landlord, which I should say more about. Um, yeah. So you were saying uh, mm -hmm. how small landlords also, like yourself, how are they different from the big landlords? Right. And, you know, what's it really like well, to be a small landlord like yourself owning, you know, a few buildings? Yes. Yeah, it's, what's it like? Being a landlord, particularly one who does most of the work themselves, Yeah isn't what it's cracked up to be. <laughs> it is not often an easy sit on your duff waiting for the cash to come in kind yeah. of business. Uh -huh. In fact, it can be darn difficult. Um, I have been a landlord for, since 1990 um, and uh, I 
could not count on 10 hands the number of times that after 12 midnight I get a call from a tenant who's either locked out or um, uh, some water has leaked into their basement or bathroom right. or wherever. Um, yeah. So there's the ongoing repair issues. There are There is everybody in the world who comes through your buildings who have all the ills and joys of life coming through. They could be dealing drugs, they could be running their businesses, they could be having parties, they could just be doing their daily life of mm -hmm. cooking and doing right. their private stuff. So it's just, it's a very challenging day-to-day -day require responsibilities of landlord to keep your building maintained, keep the peace. And these the are rent. people that you know, they're not like uh, big landlords have tons of buildings and probably don't even know their tenants, right? Yes, um, which is one of the features we'll talk about mm -hmm. here. Uh, small landlords could be up to nine units. Uh, so you may have bought your own one family and then you bought another three family, you moved out uh, of town maybe, but you still have your two, three families or you live local to your three families. Um, talk to me. Um, so it's very, um, a personal and relational kind of business. Mm -hmm. um, I happen to work for the city of Boston as the city's housing mediator. I spend all day talking to landlords and tenants about their daily lives and keeping their business buildings going. And mm. for so many of these landlords, they have ongoing connections with their tenants mm -hmm. who go to their jobs and come home and play with their kids and fix their cars up on the, in the driveways and everything about right. their lives is known to the landlord. So you develop these very personal relationships and that affects your, your business relationships sure. with them as well. No, I, I get it. And, and how can, uh, uh, you say uh, small landlords, and there are lots of them, including me, I own one apartment in Jamaica Plain where I used to live. Uh, they can play an important role, you're saying, in maintaining safe and affordable housing, something that we really need, especially in Boston where Rents are going so much, uh, up so high. Uh, can you explain how uh, small landlords can play a role in that in maintaining safe and affordable housing? Right. Landlords often, because they're small and they know their tenants, want to do the right thing and keep people mm -hmm. housed. Um, they also are very distinct from the larger owners. And mm -hmm. a couple of the examples are they, they often do their own work as much as they can. Um, right. Many of them who are low and moderate income may not have a whole lot of money to invest in their buildings and right. you know, improve them and therefore be able to get higher rents. Now, we're, we know there are a lot of small owners out there or investor owners who can buy buildings and, and, and kick tenants out, you know, fix these units up, jack up the rents or flip them for sale. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about a class of small owners <clears throat> who end up caring to... Um, keep their buildings going, it's a source of income for them. They don't need to gentrify these buildings. So they, they do their own repairs, they get to know their tenants, they know their tenants are, are not made of money, so <laughs> they don't need to jack up the rents if right. the tenant landlord situation is stable. Right. And then when tenants fall under and they become vulnerable to eviction, yeah. many of these owners, it's not the first thing on their mind that they're gonna kick these tenants out. In fact, they really, spend their time trying to keep these tenants from being evicted. So they yeah. are very much more flexible in eviction cases and all that. Yeah. No, I think you said uh, of small landlords, because they have personal relationships with their tenants, they're not just a number. They also uh, often, I think you said, I uh, feel a moral responsibility not to get every last dollar out of the building. Maybe you can tell me you know, some stories or what your experience has been like. Because I know you've been uh, a small landlord for a number of years. And uh, what, what's it been yeah. like for you or others that you've talked to, other small landlords? Yeah. Well, I mean, I um, recently took uh, some Ecuadorian uh, Americans into mm -hmm. um, this lodging house I own. I took two families in. And mm -hmm. um, it was interesting because they didn't have a lot of money, did not have checking accounts, <laughs> credit cards. Uh, a friend of mine who, who had been working with them to help them access services connected them to me. Mm -hmm. um, and the first beat for them was, let me help you out. <laughs> we can mow, we can do carpentry, we can help you deal with your, you know, keeping the trash going for That's the first thing they said? They said to me, uh -huh. you know, 
I'm not just here to, you know, be by myself and pay you the rent and not have any contact with you. Let me be part of the community. Really? Huh. And um, it made me so welcoming to them, and it huh. made me want to keep the rents reasonable. So really? when we thought about the rents, I, you know, it was a very hard thing to, to try to think about a maximum rent because they had been so, you know, forthcoming. Um, it's funny because all of it goes through Google Translator. They don't speak a word of English, so we always oh, laugh really? because we have many just, you know, body, our body language tells more than our words because they, you know, and we were often on the phone with my friend doing the translating because they have questions about how to do some repairs. They've done, they've done some roof work. They, really? Wow. Yeah, they've done some fencing work. Um, they keep the trash area clean because many of the other tenants may not care to keep the place looking nice. So, you know, the curb appeal is something people care about. So. Right. So you feel so an obligation that, with so them. So I feel responsible. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not speaking just for myself because I spend all day, excuse me, um, s talking to uh, to landlords. You know, they say, you know, I, this is a woman who I knew when I grew up, and when she asked me for housing, I knew she wanted to stay in the neighborhood. So of course I wanted to give her a place to live. This and is that, some other. So small that's another landlord, landlord that, for yeah. example, that I, you know I know her well because I've been in her house, and she has been very helpful to this owner, to this tenant, I'm sorry, um, who ended up having two kids and you know, had some work going on that and ended and then she wasn't able to pay her rent uh, in a timely fashion. This landlord <coughs> lowered her rent a certain amount really? to make uh -huh. it affordable. Hmm. She was flexible to the tenant. She got her, the tenant's parents involved who helped out because she knew the family. That's not an unusual story. Yeah, I mean, and those are stories that we frequently don't hear. We do not Those are hear. the unheard stories. We hear the right. bad stories about landlords evicting people. That's yes, and the there are those stories. Yeah, those are real, there too. There are different kinds of small oh, yeah. landlords. And, yeah. and, um, and we know how you know, incredibly difficult it can be if a tenant does not have habitable, affordable housing. Yeah. So because of that, when you talk about the morality, for so many owners, they put their tenants first because they know the so value the, the housing provides and right. their need, people need affordable housing. Although you're not saying that all small landlords have the morals and personal relationships mm. that you are describing with the Ecuadorian family or this yes. friend colleague of yes. yours. Yes, no, I spend a lot. Some uh, don't. There uh, are, uh, and we hear, we hear okay. too much about that and there yeah. is a, a, a um, a sizable proportion of these, of, of these small buildings are being bought out by yeah. investors um, who have very little interest in the community and the, right. and the concerns of their immediate tenants so and are looking at it from a profit lens. What you're saying is it's a, it's a complex story. It's, it's not all bad, it's not all yes. good. But if, uh, as you say, Peter, uh, that small landlords can play those that do have the personal relationships and the moral responsibility that some do, some small landlords do. Uh, what can government or the public or other people do to foster that and help those small landlords that do have those personal relationships, that do have that moral responsibility? What can the government or public policy do to support those small landlords yeah. uh, in maintaining the safe and affordable housing that some small landlords are uh, as you say, yes. uh, really maintaining. Yes, it's a really good question because yeah. almost half of our residential housing units in this country are owned by small owners. If you call a small owner somebody who owns fewer than nine units. Half of the rental but housing half is of owned our by... We don't realize how yeah. large a population of buildings <laughs> Are in are small buildings owned by small owners who are not corporations, right. yeah. many of whom, particularly in inner cities, maintain these stable relationships with their tenants. Right. So what can the so as far as what can so so, policy, so because yeah. of that, that's why public policy really can be extremely uh, can can help us preserve affordable housing and prevent homelessness for tenants. Um, most virtually all small landlords don't have the same things that large owners have. So uh, I'm going to say what they are and yeah. why public policy, some resources to help small owners would make a big difference. You look at the large owners, whether they have affordable dollars in there to keep rents affordable or not, have a battery, an you know, army of professionals. Right. They have property managers, lawyers, lawyers accountants, right. maintenance supervisors, bookkeepers, 
They also have resident service coordinators. The big the, ones, right. The big guys. Yeah, yeah. And when I say the resident service coordinators, what I mean is that part of the, the job of keeping a building going is keeping tenants stable so they can do what they were supposed to do, which is pay the rent, not cause damage, and not yeah. call the police you know, for, for noise issues. So right. if more of that kind of assistance were available to small owners, even you know, some large owners now who work with small owners use Medicaid to get services to tenants in housing right. who can't yeah. maintain themselves with you know, food hmm. and sanitation. Uh, so, so helping owners, um, me, me, if we could bring the cost of property management down and make uh, access to handy people, make access okay. to uh, legal assistance, affordable, all the costs that owners don't have to pay for those folks will be, pl will be pushed back into helping these tenants keep their housing. Because okay. owners don't have a lot of these extra dollars to take it right. professional. So, so if there was like a government service for a handy man or handy woman, to, instead of calling the plumber to do a, a job that maybe a handy person could right. do, for the plumber might charge $300, someone else could charge 50 or 100 uh, yes. But a lot of landlords are saying don't have yeah, those they're, they're, Because as we discussed earlier that many don't understand how to hire and supervise yeah, right now. They don't understand how to negotiate uh, on uh, uh, legal issues, which we'll talk about in a second. But for yeah. just on the fixing, um, if and there are public programs and more of these kind of programs, such as um, the city of Boston and many city and state uh, programs across the country, uh, incentivize the owners to keep their rents affordable by giving them rehab. Um, so the city will do this, where they'll diagnose your problem, get a rehab plan, get the building fixed, and for every year that you keep your rent affordable, defer the cost of the payback. Mm. So over 20 years, 5% a year, you got $40,000 of rehab into your property, you've kept your rent affordable f for uh, a person in need, that's a public program that could be expanded because mm -hmm. it's a positive incentive. Many owners will keep their rents affordable. They just need help managing their properties. So on the rehab side and then on the legal side. So what I'd spend all day is providing legal education and problem solving assistance on tenant landlord issues that drive mm -hmm. landlords to drink. They don't know <laughs> how to deal with a extra you know, unauthorized occupant or, you know, a a wall that gets bashed in by a friend who was a little loud after hours. How do right. you put a tenant on notice? How do you negotiate so you don't evict, but you put consequences out to tenants by helping landlords understand their rights and responsibilities and help them work out these issues? Because it's uh, and that's complicated. That is complicated business. And you don't want to have to hire a lawyer if you don't have to. Six hundred dollars or six hundred dollars an hour. More, yeah. you know, more expensive than plumbers. <laughs> Not know. that we don't right. value lawyers when we need well, them. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, lawyers can play a role. But much of this work can be done by legal assistance, management assistance. And um, much cheaper, you're saying. Way cheaper. Way and, cheaper. Right. Then that helps the small landlords, and then they They are, pass can, the savings on to the, you this know, tenant. The city is helping them. Right. They can right. uh, more likely maintain their yeah. uh, I mean, even for example, affordable. right. I mean, so it's for so many owners who may have bought their buildings when they had jobs and good credit now, they have some equity in their property, but they can't get a loan, let alone a home equity line. And they don't know how to get capital into their building, to get money so they can fix their buildings. Yeah. And so just to help them figure out how to get financial. And that stuff is really complicated. I mean, just personally, I'm trying to get a loan out of my building, and I've got a master's degree from the world's greatest <laughs> university, supposedly, <laughs> and it's uh, driving me to drink, you know, I'm so, just about. I mean, I might even have a beer after this, you know. <laughs> but seriously, Peter, are there other things? We only have a couple minutes that, um, I think this is important what you're saying, that there are a lot of small landlords, and you're making it clear, not all of them are like you or like your colleagues who are caring and trying to keep the rents low. Some are uh, let's say, as unscrupulous as the biggest landlords. Uh, but are there other things that you could think of? Uh, because it's important what I think you're saying, that so much of rental housing is owned by small, quote, mom and pop or whatever uh, landlords. Are there other things that uh, the public can do, government can do to uh, 
maintain those rents low with those, quote, small mom and pop landlords that want to be moral and want to maintain their property well? Are there other things you can do? Well, uh, there, I mean, there, there's been an a, a, a ongoing conversation across the country and increasingly now in the city of Boston around controlling rents. Mm -hmm. um, uh, e whether we call it stabilization of rents rent, or just cause eviction is the piece where mm -hmm. you s prevent evictions except for cause, so the mm -hmm. owners can't p possess their buildings. Um, th there are many other important schemes that should be explored that may prevent the worst excesses of the market. Uh, mm -hmm. We know that on one end of the market we have uh, you know, small or large owners who don't have the personal relationships, for whom it's primarily a business with a bottom line, and who may not be as uh, sensitive to the needs of the tenants. And that yeah. is an understatement. So for certain owners, um, helping uh, protect the tenants from r rent increases and evictions is really critical. On the small owner side, um, the trick is to keep small owners stable. So. Mm -hmm. um, Public programs that uh, supervise and help owners get through the rehab process, that help them manage their conflicts, that help them get financing, that help them deal with their estate. Plan. Okay, all that stuff would be helpful. Yes. And, and Peter Gilman Shapiro has literally written the book, uh, particularly for small landlords. This book is called The Good Landlord. I've read it. It's terrific. <laughs> it's been actually very helpful to me because I am one of those teeny tiny landlords. I literally <laughs> own one apartment where I used to live in uh, Jamaica Plain. And it's been really helpful uh, for me. And I think anyone that owns uh, uh, an apartment, whether you plan to be a quote landlord or not, can really benefit from reading this book. It has a lot of uh, good information about how to mediate disputes, how to deal on a personal level uh, with uh, your tenants. And, you know, I can speak just personally. For me, it's been, it's been really helpful. Uh, the book, The Good Landlord, A Guide to Making a Profit While Making a Difference is, uh, if there's a bookstore near you, you can probably find it. You also Amazon. can find it on uh, Amazon. Well, we're not going to talk well, about we don't need the to A that. word, you know, because... Uh, <laughs> We'd you can rather find support me the, you can at find Peter at thegoodlandlord.com. Peter at thegoodlandlord.com. Uh, I'm very responsive. And uh, so I really appreciate you taking the time to come in because uh, I know you mediate a lot of very difficult disputes with tenants and landlords uh, in the city of Boston, which has hired you for many years to do that. And um, you know, I just really appreciate what you're doing because, uh, as you say, a lot of... Uh, People don't know that so much of rental housing is owned by these mom and pop, so to speak, small landlords like, like yourself. Yeah, who yeah. have these personal relationships with their tenants that is, allows tenants to keep their housing, not be evicted, yeah. for, and, and pay for the rest of life because we know how high a proportion of our income goes to housing. So yeah. it's such a critical aspect that of our people's lives. When they have affordable, decent housing, they can have schooling, they can be part of a community, they can mm -hmm. um, go to school and, 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 and make friends and develop their lives in ways that we want for everybody, not no. especially for tenants who well, may not have no. access to buying. No, thanks, Peter. Again, I'm Michael Jacoby Brown, your host of We Hold These Truths. And we're very lucky to have Peter Gilman Shapiro, author of The Good Landlord, uh, who's uh, let us learn a little bit about how small landlords are actually playing an often not widely understood but important role in maintaining safe and affordable rental housing. So thanks a lot for thank coming you. here, Peter. And it's uh, great to see you. And thanks for all you're sure, doing. Thank you. Okay. And we'll see you at the next installment of We Hold These Truths. Thank you very much. Again, I'm Michael Jacoby Brown. I'm your host for We Hold These Truths. And thanks a lot for uh, watching our program today. Thank you.